How did it come to this? To Calvary and the cross. The conception of Jesus by the Holy Spirit was announced by an angel to his virgin mother, full of grace. His growth in the womb brought confessions of faith from his unborn kinsman and forerunner, John the Baptist, and from John's mother, Elizabeth. His birth was greeted with joyful song by the choir of angels and with puzzled wonder by both shepherds and philosophers. The hidden years of the youth of Jesus, who lived in obedience to his virgin mother and his foster father, were filled with growth as he was filled with wisdom. At length, he came forth from Galilee, preaching a gospel of love, forgiveness, and peace. He healed the sick, made the blind to see, the deaf to hear, and the dumb to speak. He restored palsied limbs and gave life to the dead. So how did it come to this? The birth of Jesus, while greeted with joy by some, was also greeted with fear and rage by others. Innocent children in Bethlehem were slaughtered just so he might not live. To save his life, his parents had to flee with him through the desert to safety in Egypt and live there in hiding until the murderous pagan king died. Once Jesus began his public ministry, he called all people to conversion from their sins and condemned false religion as an offense to God Most High, arousing the hatred and enmity of the scribes and Pharisees who found great gain in religion and who held in contempt the itinerant rabbi from Nazareth. But how did it come to this? This was foretold by Simeon, the righteous and devout man who greeted the Holy Family in the temple at Jerusalem. Behold, this child is destined for the rise and fall of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be contradicted. How did it come to this? It came to this because he came for this, to suffer and to die and to rise again, that our age-old captivity to sin and death might be destroyed forever. When Jesus first announced this strange and awful truth to the Twelve, they could not bear it. No sooner had Simon Peter confessed his faith that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, than Jesus began to teach the Twelve that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer greatly from the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. This was too much for Peter. God forbid, Lord, no such thing should ever happen to you. But on hearing Peter's protest, the Lord Jesus, who had just named Simon the rock on whom his church would be built, exclaimed, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And we too, like Simon Peter, so easily set our minds on the things of man. The calculus of human experience is too often employed to justify our sins, to refuse even to acknowledge that our sins are sins, to excuse our selfish disregard for the suffering of others, and to reject the law of love as the only way to live in harmony with God's eternal plan for our salvation. But we set our minds on the things of man so easily because to set our minds on the things of God requires that we accept several disruptive and painful truths. That we are sinners in need of redemption. That unless we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, we remain lost. That our redemption was accomplished only by the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that our acceptance of that redemption demands that we join the Lord Jesus in the thing Peter most feared, the way of self-denial and ongoing conversion, 
the way of the obedience of faith, the way of penance and reconciliation, the way of the cross. The call to the way of the cross is constant, but this year it is unavoidable. Since the pandemic began a few weeks ago, 17,000 Americans have lost their lives and 17 million have lost their jobs. Around the world, more than 100,000 have died and the damage to the global economy is vast. We are separated from each other and from the altar of the Lord by a quarantine that will last we know not how long. Good Friday is always somber, but this year many of us feel bereft, even desolate. In fictional Narnia, under the reign of the White Witch, it was always winter, but never Christmas. And now under the real burden of pestilence, it seems that it will always be Lent, but never Easter. But it only seems that way. The victory of the resurrection was made possible by the defeat of the cross, and the Lord Jesus invites us to follow him in the way of self-denial, precisely so that he can share with us the glory of his resurrection. How did it come to this? How did it come to Calvary and the cross? It came to this because it was the plan from the very beginning of creation. The cross is the price of our freedom and the remedy for the misuse of our freedom. It came to this because I drove him to this. We all drove him to this. The Lord Jesus had to come to the cross if we are not to live as slaves to our own disordered self-love, but to live instead as children of our Heavenly Father, children adopted by grace and restored to the evangelical freedom for which we were created. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Let us therefore stand firm and not submit again to the yoke of slavery by returning to our sins. And here we learn the deepest truth of the cross. Christ was crucified not by the hatred of those who rejected him. No, the Lord Jesus was held to the cross by perfect love his perfect love for each and every human person so that we could all share his glory forever, the glory as of the only Son from the Father. And that finally is how it came to this. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us full of grace and truth, precisely so that he could suffer and die and rise from the dead to free us from sin, liberate us from the grave, restore us to life, and raise us to share his glory forever. So God be praised that it did come to this. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world.